For me, it's been a, a pretty interesting week of sermon preparation. I, uh, from the very inception of this little sort of mini-series on the book of Numbers that we've embarked on, I've thought that I knew how it would end. In other words, from the beginning, I thought I knew the end. Um, but then through a series of events, through the time that I've spent in preparation in the particular readings that, uh, that uh, I've been dwelling on this week and through a particular event, things changed for me. And I found God speaking to me through the power of the Spirit and moving me in a, in a completely different direction or a somewhat different direction. In actual fact, staying more in line with what I've been focusing on in, in at least the last three um, sermons that, uh, that we've shared together over the last few weeks. So we're concluding this morning our kind of cursory examination of the book of Numbers as part of our sermon series, The Never-Ending Story in Five Acts. And this portion my portion, entitled The Journey of God's People, has been Act 3. But um, don't get the idea, just because we're kind of ending at, at this point, don't get the idea that, that the rest of our sermon series will leave the topic behind that journey of God's people because the state of being in the wilderness is really what it's all about. It's also where we found and find such strong correlation between the situation of God's people then and our situation at Queensway now. I hope that you've come to that realization as we've gone through uh, this little series. And it's also where we find, um, indeed, not only Queensway's place in all of this, but the entire situatedness of Christ's church here and now can be described as a wilderness experience, a, a state of moving through a hostile, intemperate, spiritual environment toward a new and spiritually dynamic land of milk and honey, so to speak, the promised land. But I'm going to leave it to Ryan and Dave to kind of develop that wilderness theme a little bit further over the coming weeks. As I've spoken to you about numbers, I've used two significant viewpoints that Hebrew scholars have found helpful in summarizing the contents. One, the Jewish saying that should be thoroughly embedded in your consciousness by now, and that is, of course, God has time, the wilderness has sand. And the second one is the Hebrew names for the book of numbers, and God spoke. And to begin our journey in the first week, I asked the question, when God speaks, are we listening? And for the second week, I continued that theme with the question, when God speaks, do we understand the language? And last week, I asked the question, when God speaks, will we hear and obey? And all the way through, I've been making the point that humans have great difficulty separating themselves from their own self-interestedness and allowing God to have his rightful place at the center of a, our universe. And this week, I continue with that same theme by asking another question. And here it is. When God speaks, how do we obey? Now, to be clear, I am not asking what the act of obedience is supposed to look like. I think we know 
what it means to obey. Simply doing what you are asked to do, what you're told to do. No, what I'm asking is this. What is the essential posture from which obedience emanates? From where does it come? I'm going to suggest that the act of obedience has at its heart something that is the very essence of the Christian experience. In fact, it is the very foundation of any meaningful experience of God. In our present cultural context, and indeed ever since humankind has organized itself into functionally, culturally exclusive family and societal groups, Obedience has been related to an identified power structure. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that those who have control over the ability to maintain safety and security, including life-sustaining mechanisms, are those who exercise power. In order to benefit... One is essentially required to cooperate, to obey. Obedience thus becomes the product of coercion. Failure to obey results in consequences, and often they are negative consequences. Obedience is therefore the reaction to and the product of a power dynamic. Last week... I made these statements, and I'm going to quote myself here. Quote, I think we give lip service to the idea of obedience. Of course, obedience and submission are major tenets of the faith. And I went on to say, but as we discovered last week, it was easier to complain, rationalize, and use others as scapegoats than to move forward in obedience, unquote. And frankly, I was just a little surprised that no one called me on those assertions. I would have hoped that someone might have asked me why I think that obedience and submission are major tenets of the faith. I know we take that for granted, but why? Why? So, even though nobody asked, I want to try and answer those questions this morning. Because many of us think of our relationship to God in terms of a coercive power structure. That is what is meant, and what they meant, when the Jewish rabbis say, God has time, and the wilderness has sand. Remember, these folks do not accept that we have the ability to enter into a grace period save for strict adherence to Torah because they don't accept that Jesus is the hope for Messiah and that His presence and his work here on earth has ushered in a period of grace apart from the law. What the rabbis mean is that the wilderness experiences teaches that one should obey or else God will bury you. They see it as the central message of Torah, the law. God must be obeyed. It's a big deal. We also know that it is impossible to keep the law perfectly, and that that is what sacrifices were for. Remember how Jack covered the atonement theology so well just a few weeks ago. So it seems pretty clear that a reasonable response to God's power is obedience based on fear. Or is it? Is fear at the heart of of obedience. Is that the message of numbers? Is that why there are so many examples of God destroying many 
of his disobedient people. Is this the God that we can love and trust when we find that he is ultimately saying through his messengers, do what I tell you to do or else I'll kill you? And Jesus, Jesus made it pretty clear that he was not about changing the law. In fact, he spoke about how important it was. What all aspects of the law are in reference to the need for obedience. Actually, he said that one should do it even better than the religious folks were doing it at the time. Let's just read what he said in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa! But then, note, that he also said something really interesting and pretty hard to understand. He said that he was the fulfillment of the law. Well, what's that all about? And I do realize that one of the explanations is that Jesus is the fulfillment, the ultimate atonement sacrifice, and by virtue of his actions, the law has been fulfilled. Basic atonement theology. I get it. But I also wonder if there isn't an even if there isn't even more to it than that. Is it possible that obedience is not based on fear? Could it be based on something else entirely? Is there something at the heart of obedience that is even the direct opposite of fear? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. So let's go back to the book of Numbers. I want to go to Numbers uh, chapter 16, verses 20 and 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces, and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and will you be angry with all of the congregation? See that phrase? They fell on their faces. Why would they do that? And, and, and look at these verses. Numbers 16, verses 43 and 45. And Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Get away from the midst of this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. There it is again. And one might say that it's just a natural byproduct of being in the presence of a holy and a powerful God. And one would be correct. But I'm also going to suggest to you that this action is far more significant than that. I'm going to suggest that this phrase, and they fell on their faces, relates to a posture which defines a relationship with God that speaks to every generation and every culture, past, present, and future. It is the essence of our ability to relate to God and to each other as new creatures with a new life and a new way of being alive. So what does the phrase mean? 
Why do Moses and Aaron suddenly drop to the ground face down? Now, this is not the first time such an action has been recorded. It is called prostration. And we have read about it before in the book of Numbers. In, in fact, a word search reveals instances of Abraham and others doing the same thing. And as we move forward throughout Scripture, we'll discover that other individuals and groups of people have, have experienced this falling on their face before God. That would even include Jesus, and, and, and we'll get to that. The Hebrew Bible refers to prostration in two ways, falling on one's face or bowing low. It could be anything from a, a deep standing bow to kneeling and putting one's forehead to the floor, or to go as far as stretching out full length. In the Torah, it is a formal and a deliberate act signifying deference, obedience, worship. But there is a special Hebrew word used for this phrase, falling on one's face. Or throwing oneself down on one's face. I'm not going to go into the word. It wouldn't mean anything to you anyway. But its meaning is this. It's a more dramatic form of prostration. It happens at times before a manifestation of God. As people are overcome with awe, and at times, other times, to initiate communication with God. In Torah, only Abraham, Joshua, Ezekiel, and Moses, once by himself and four times with Aaron, are brave enough to initiate communication with God. And in all of these circumstances, it happens after they fall on their faces. They want to speak. They want God to speak to them directly, to answer their questions and tell them what to do next, to grab God's attention. They apparently feel the need to do something more dramatic than just a formal prostration. Moses falls on his face in last week's message when the Israelites have been weeping all night in despair of taking over Canaan, and they decide to choose a new leader and go back to Egypt in the morning. Moses remains prostrate and silent, waiting for God to respond, and, and God finally manifests just in time to stop the Israelites from stoning Joshua and Caleb. Looking at our current passages this morning, number 16 to 22, Moses and Aaron fall on their faces, pleading with God. God, God of the spirits of all flesh, one man is guilty and you rage against the whole community. God instructs Moses to tell everyone to stand back from their tents and then God makes the earth swallow the tent. And the three ringleaders and their families all disappear in an earthquake, and fire went out from God, and it consumed the 250 men offering incense in support of the rebels. Number 16, verse 35. The next day, all the Israelites protest against Moses and Aaron, blaming them for the death of 253 people. So God threatens to consume the lot of them. But then Moses said to Aaron, take the incense pan and place fire on it from the altar. Put in incense and go quickly to the community and atone for them because the rage has gone out before God. The affliction has begun, Numbers 17, verses 9 to 11. And instead of following God's order and running away, Moses and Aaron throw themselves down on their faces. And this time we find God in the middle of slaughtering the Israelites with a fast-acting disease. But Moses finds out how to stop the epidemic through the, through the use of Aaron's incense. If they had not fallen on their faces, perhaps God would have wiped up everyone. I could go on, 
But I think you get the point. This, this dramatic position of prostration becomes a metaphor. And that metaphor defines not only the right way to approach God for answers, but I believe that it's even more than that. It's a way to frame our entire interaction with God. It, it is the... the um, the act of submission. But I don't mean act in the sense of a behavior, of a process. It's it's so much more than that. It is a way of being. We often accept obedience and submission as words that essentially mean the same thing. But I don't believe that that's the case. Now, one could make the point, and and I would consider it a valid point, that obedience is predicated by submission. Ah, I'd agree with that. But if we just parked on that, I think we'd miss an opportunity to explore an even more significant truth, which is this. Submission defines everything in our relationship with God. I think this significant act, this metaphor, teaches us that obedience, worship, prayer, suffering, being a church, being followers of Christ, in fact, everything that we can think of related to our relationship with God is predicated on that word and all that it means. Submission. I think of Tevia and Fiddler on the Roof, who sings the song about tradition. I guess this morning I'm singing the song about submission. So it was my intention to explore this concept in a number of ways this morning. I wanted to dwell on a bit of Trinitarian theology and talk about how how the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can be thought of as existing in mutual submission to one another. But I won't. I I, I just don't have time to do that. Because I've been led in another direction. Why? It's because at the beginning of the week, I, as well as many others, was confronted with the terrible news of the discovery of 215 children's graves at the site of a former residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. Any thinking and feeling person, particularly a thinking and feeling Christian, needs a way to process and to come to terms with that terrible discovery coupled with the fact that these schools existed as an arm of the church. We need to face the fact that these places promoted their existence as places carrying out the work of God. To be missional, so to speak. My goodness. We can get it so wrong, can't we? If the debacle of these misguided attempts at enculturation, not just systematic racism, but the actual attempt to eradicate a whole race of people teaches us anything, it is that we knew very little about the true mission of God back then, and it certainly begs the question, have we learned anything about God's true message, sorry, true mission now? We believe that we discern God's will to be the administration and application of justice in the world. How how in God's name can this debacle be justified? And it's not an isolated case. The church is guilty of all kinds of historical atrocities in every part of the world for decades. Such occurrences are not the product of God's restorative justice. 
They're not the product of a church operating under submission to God's mission of justice and peace and restoration. Such deformed, grotesque operations are straight from Satan. They stand in direct opposition to God's desire for a church that demonstrates peace, love, and safety for all who are made in the image of God. Pastors, priests, and leaders of the church must call the church to truthful revelation and repentance. What happened at these residential schools in the name of God is the antithesis of a church operating under the principle of submission. There are other less extreme examples of a misrepresented emphasis on cultural and ungodly values. We need to name them for what they are because they sap our spiritual energy and reduce our gatherings to self-seeking social clubs rife with the excesses of consumerism and self-satisfaction. As a result, our churches can become exhausted, burnt out, questioning whether they are doing anything in, in terms of a redemptive action in the world. And that's a very worthy question not to be dismissed. The church must cultivate the means to discern God's work in the world in order to participate in a way that does not effectively remove God from the process because he won't stand for it. I just wonder if this whole idea of framing everything within the context of submission can give us not just the starting place, but the entire lens with which to view ourselves as people organized to do God's work. Because it's through submission to God that we are required to, at the same time, be submitted to one another. Submission is the place to begin and the place to end. It becomes the place of rest and yet also the springboard for active participation. But submission is a matter of the will. It's not a choice. Oh, sorry, it is a choice. Because one can choose not to submit. And when I say that, I'm not talking about choosing to behave in a certain way. I'm talking about choosing to be in a certain posture. And if we don't do that, of course, it has its eventual, natural, God-ordained consequences. So we need this posture of mutual submission in order to discern his presence and, and then participate in his work. And one of the places it can happen is when we practice communion together at, at this table as we're going to do this morning. Here around the Lord's table, we learn to tend to the real presence of Christ. We learn the right postures which enable us to get out of our own way, to tend to what Christ has done and is doing, and to co cooperate with him and with one another. What happens around the Lord's table and as we worship together on Sundays can carry over into all the other meals in our homes and our neighborhoods. All our other ways of being together. Perhaps this metaphor of a posture of submission can be explained by focusing on different ways of being present at the Lord's table. Because we're celebrating communion this morning, I, I thought I might suggest some ways of thinking about being around the Lord's table together that relates to this way of being in submission even if we're gathered in a virtual way. So let's call them postures, for want of a better word. 
postures that we might cultivate as we gather around the Lord's table and partake of the bread and the cup, his body and blood, sharing his presence which we take with us into all of our other social realities. Give me a sec, I just lost my place. We must come with a a posture of surrender. One cannot come to the Lord's table apart from submitting to Jesus. To his presence and what is happening in, in and around the table. It's a posture of surrender to Christ which attends to his presence and leads to submission to others. Jesus illustrated it in Luke 22. Amidst the disciples striving for position and power, he inaugurates the table with the words, As my Father has conferred on me, so I confer on you a kingdom. And he announces that the authority that shall be manifest here around this table shall be one of servanthood to one another. In the Gospel of John, Jesus models this submission by washing the disciples' feet. This posture of submission to Christ and one to another is is absolutely foundational for the discerning of Christ's presence among us. And it also opens space for his work to be visible among us as we are in the world. We also need to cultivate a posture of receiving. At the beginning of the Lord's table, we give thanks. As pastors, Ryan and I, we we take the elements, we bless them, we break the bread, we give thanks. And after which comes that time when we receive these gifts from God. Elements representing the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. We gratefully acknowledge him as the source of everything. This posture of giving thanks translates into a posture of receiving what God will accomplish as he distributes the blessings of the kingdom through us. A foretaste of the promised land flowing with his complete presence. There's one button that if I come even close to, everything just goes haywire on this thing. I must must refrain from getting close to it. We gratefully acknowledge him as the source of everything. A foretaste of his complete presence. We must receive the cup, not to take it. Thus we cultivate this posture of receiving what God would do among us instead of trying to control it. We are present with our brothers and sisters in Christ in the conflicts and the struggles, the hurts and the pain that each of us may bear. But we must also cultivate a posture of ceasing to strive to present ourselves as the prime focus. Part of tending to Christ's presence is the quieting of our ego, releasing the urge to control and solve problems. We must become centered on Christ in this space among us. Luke chapter 10, verse 38, Martha was distracted by her many tasks, trying to get things in order and under control. So she gets angry and asks Jesus to get her sister Mary in line and start helping her. 
But Jesus replies, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need for only one thing. Cease the striving and become present to me. Here at the table, there is a presence that puts our concerns on the back burner as we tend to each person with whom we participate. For in them we find the presence of Christ. Not in this oversaturated view of ourselves and the promotion of our own ego. There's a trust that builds from all of this. A space is open for God to work here amongst us. This mutual submission is essential to discerning Christ's presence among us. Through this act, we discover that there is more going on than a simple encounter between folks participating in a liturgical ceremony. Through submitting ourselves to one another, Jesus has actually become present among us, and if we will tend to this reality, our lives and our relationships will be changed. Because that's what Jesus does. Could it be that this is what the Apostle Paul was stressing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when he says that there are divisions and factions among the church at Corinth. The wealthy are disregarding the poor among them, not even noticing that they had nothing to eat while they were gorging themselves. So Paul then says quite boldly in verse 20, it's not the Lord's supper you eat. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper. In other words, you're focused on yourselves. And that's the very definition of self-interest. In our reading this morning, we had the description of Jesus falling on his face and submitting to his Father's will. Let me read it again. Matthew 26, verse 39, And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Oh. Christ's act of ultimate submission leads to the forgiveness of sins, reconciliation, and the renewal of all things. It's this submission that shapes all relationships in the kingdom. This relational pattern materializes in the forgiveness of sins, reconciliation, and the renewal of God's creation. Each time we take the bread, the body of Christ broken for us, and drink the wine representing his shed blood, we receive and we give forgiveness. And it is this submission to the spirit of forgiveness which governs our life together. Each time we receive the elements, we're rehearsing our reconciliation with God and with each other. And it's the submission to the spirit of reconciliation that governs our relationships. Therefore, Reconciliation, by definition, requires submission. There is also renewal. The new covenant in his blood. The newness of relationship with God, the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. All of this has been made possible through the work of the Holy Spirit and only makes sense when you view it through the lens of of submission, that posture of submission. So perhaps, perhaps we could meditate on, on these few things as Pastor Ryan leads us through our communion service this morning.